Hey y'all, Coach Nefi here, you guys. Stacy with me. Shalom. And in today's class, we're going to be looking at a few very important prophecies. Okay. We're going to be looking at Jacob's trouble, and we're going to be comparing it to that prophecy of the 400 years given to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to talk about the X across America and how that could be related to it all. Okay. And we'll even talk about the sabbatical years too, because all of these seem to be tied together. Right. The first thing we'll do is we'll talk about the 400 year prophecy and then we'll come back and talk about the X across America. And after that, we'll talk about Jacob's trouble and then we'll get a little bit into the sabbatical year. Okay. Sounds as, good. As we try to tie all of this together. Like I said, it seems like it's all pointing around the same time. Mm -hmm. Maybe not necessarily the same day. There seems to be some separation in these events, but it's not more than a few years or so. Right. All right. So first of all, let's jump over here to the book of Genesis, chapter 15 and verse 13. If you would read that. And he said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. OK, now this is talking about the American slave here. Yes, we know this by now. Through all of the lies and mistruths, uh, replacement theology, people wanting to, um, you know, say it related to this people or the Jewish people or somebody else. Um, facts are facts. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you um, want to know more about it, if you really are seeking the truth, you can always just Google it. It's there for everybody's eyes. To yeah. See. Nobody really touched Google, though, do they? Especially over Moses, they can come right here to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and 48 and see that when it's talking about these iron yokes about these people's necks. Right. Correct. And then down in verse 68 of the same chapter is talking about how they will be returned to Egypt by way of ships. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there is no way to get from Jerusalem to Egypt by way of a ship. So he's not talking about that period of time. He's actually talking about them being floated over here to this modern day Egypt. Yes. So with these two verses alone, we can be assured of who we actually talking about with this 400 years that Abraham is hearing about back in Genesis. Mm -hmm. Now, before we get off of this, read verse 14. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. So this is a serious prophecy. This is one of the bigger ones in the scripture because it's saying after these 400 years of slavery, um, this nation. The whole nation would be judged mm -hmm. and the people would come out with a great substance. Now, that reminds you of the days of Egypt with Noah and them back there, because that's exactly what happened. Well, yeah, people always attribute that um, this scripture 13 and 14 to when um, the Messiah, well, not the Messiah, when the father came in and um, laid down the plagues upon Egypt and they came out and they borrowed from the Egyptians, but that wasn't 400 years. Yeah, they do so because of the 430 years between the time that Abraham got the covenant and the time they exited Egypt. Right. You, you remember that Abraham was actually sojourning in Egypt. He went in and out of Egypt, even from his childhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at Exodus and chapter 12 and verse 40, it seems like there is a connection between the 430 years and the 400 your prophecy. Right. But it is actually not. Right. Because you remember that they went into Egypt in peace. Yeah, they were not slaves. They were not slaves at all. And they stayed there accumulating great wealth and possessions until that last Pharaoh came. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. the last it was the last Pharaoh that didn't like them and decided to harm them. So, you know, that you could imagine their um tribulation would have been no more than about forty or sixty years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not 400 years. But anyway, what I was talking about was this judgment here and how after these 400 years were up, it would be like the days of Egypt when the angel of the Lord or the death angel came in and wreaked havoc on that country, even destroyed just about everything in the country of Egypt. All while they walked out into the wilderness with great substance. Mm -hmm. They had all of their gold. They had a bunch of cattle, had a whole bunch of stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what's supposed to happen now, where this nation, this modern day Egypt, 
You know, they, they, this is a modern day Egypt because you have to remember that it was Egypt back then, you know, uh, with Israel back then, um, about 1500 BC, that things like um, buying and selling food was created. Right. Um, that was the first time with Joseph selling that corn after the famine or during the famine that humans had to pay to purchase food. Right. Before that, no one ever bought food. They grew their own. Mm hmm. And another thing that was created in Egypt was prisons. Mm -hmm. Before Egypt, there was no such thing as incarcerating a person. When they committed a crime, you either whipped them, fined them, or killed them. Right. Putting them in prison for a long period of time was is not actually biblical. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was created in Egypt. Yeah. Another thing that um, we discovered that was created around that time was... Um, having to pay to bury your dead. Right. The Pharaoh, we learned, I believe it is in the book of Jasher, the Pharaoh got his name by making profits off of burying people. Right. So mm -hmm. for the first time in human history, people had to pay to die. Right. And still to this day, we're the only species that has to pay to die and pay to eat. Pay to live. Pay to live. That's an Egyptian principle. And that's why our money has all of these Egyptian symbols in it. That's why when you look at the nation's capital and other things around the world, you see all of this Egyptian stuff around. Yeah. We basically have gotten rich off the Egyptian way of doing things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, so those, so those are great similarities, especially when you consider that both of these nations will be judged uh, eventually. And Israel, our father's people, will once again, come out with this great substance. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that they told us that this prophecy would end in the year 2019. Mm -hmm. They said that the first slaves came over to America in 1619, therefore starting this 400 year prophecy. Right. And that's why they was talking about parades and all of that kind of stuff back there in 2019 to commemorate this 400 years. Yes, I remember it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Well, was it big a deal as we thought it should be when we're looking back over here at Genesis and it's saying that there should be this huge judgment and this great substance? Mm -hmm. Did we see that? Mm, I don't think so. No, we haven't seen it. So we haven't seen this prophecy fulfillment yet. So that brings in question, when did slavery start? Because, of course, the scripture is correct. I know there are some that's going to throw out the Bible and say it was wrong instead of throwing out the history book and say, hey, well, maybe they didn't get the first slave date right. Yeah, there are people who will say that um, that the Bible has been uh, distorted and that the dates are false. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll blame it on the scripture instead of blaming it on man. Right. But we know that's not the case. If there's any error, it's going to be human error. Right. I believe so. so we look back and we say, OK, well, when did slavery start? We know that it didn't start in 1619, because if it had started in 1619, the judgment would have absolutely had to happen in 2019. Mm -hmm. And we did not see that. President Trump was plucking along just fine in 2019. Yeah. Him in America and even a couple of years after that. So there has been no judgment even to this day. And we're here almost ending the year 2021. And there hasn't been any great substance. Either. The, the good substance is not there yet. So when did slavery end? Well, we're over here at a website, theguardian.com. And we're looking at a page where they're talking about the 400 years since slavery a timeline of American history. And you see where it says that in 1619, a ship with 20 captives landed in Port of Virginia. Mm -hmm. So that's what they're calling the beginning of slavery is when these 20 so-called captives arrived in Virginia. Right. But we understand that this is not true because they weren't actually captives. They were not slaves. They weren't slaves. They were what's known as indentured servants. Mm -hmm. And an indentured servant is not a slave. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been an indentured servant in my lifetime before. Okay. I had to have that car and I had to pay for that car. So I had to keep working until I got that car paid for. Right. Right. That's mm -hmm. kind of like what an indentured servant is. Well, that's the meaning of it. Down here in the article, it says an indentured servant would be required to work a set amount of time, then granted freedom. Um, that would be a lot of people because yeah. every day, you know, you go to work just to pay for the things that you've acquired. Not, you know, most people don't go to work because they want to. They go to work because they 
are indebted to. Well, uh, it's slavery in America is misunderstood. People want to act like slavery in America changed back there in about 1865 with the Emancipation Proclamation or whatever. But it actually didn't. It didn't end. It changed. It was no longer about using whips and chains in order to control people and make them work and do your task for you. It changed to where now we could use money as the whip and the chain. Yeah, there's something you've all, you always tell the children. Um, in order to get a person to do something, you have to make them want to do make it. Make them want to do it. And so now, no longer do they use violence and, and like you said, whipping and things like that. Now they use um, money. Yeah, they're gonna take your paycheck. Right. They're gonna they're gonna fire you all together. They're gonna they're gonna re, they're gonna give you time off. That's going to reduce your paycheck, making it harder for you to take care of your daily needs or feed your children. And or they're going to threaten to take your job away from you altogether, either of which is going to put you back in line. Mm -hmm. You're going to do what they tell you to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Or the whips and the chains will be in the form of thorns and thistles. Yeah. And then you think about it. There's somebody that's over you, you know, yeah. your boss who, you know, and back then we would call the master. Yeah. Uh, so it's just and that, a different way. Of yeah. Doing it. And that's not biblical either. Right. We were never really supposed to work for other people. Yeah, the Bible right. tells us to work, but it does, but when it talks about working for other people, it puts us in terms of hiring out. Yeah. That took place also. Uh, you know, we learn about that in the book of Jasher as well. Yeah. Um, back in Egypt. Where they were, where so that's an Egyptian thing to, yeah, yeah. have someone over you to have a boss, have a super a boss, boss. because you, you know, the way it started, he was supposed to be our boss, right? He was supposed to, uh, talking about our father was supposed to provide, and he still wants to provide our food, clothing, and shelter for us. The problem is that we've gotten so far away from his ways, talking about humanity as a whole, has gotten so far away from universal laws that we can no longer feel the presence of those angelic figures that are set here to help us with our provisions right mm -hmm. growing food or whatever we do have help but we have to be at least in a state of cleanliness that we can in take part in that help mm -hmm. but anyway we're looking back over here at a website from pbs.org that's talking about these indentured servants back there in 1619. And when you look here, it says that some of these indentured servants were still free as of 1623 and 1624. Wow. So with this evidence, knowing for surety that the 400 year prophecy did not end yet, and looking back at man's history and his timeline of the slavery, we see that there is some range here. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are still within the margin of error of this so-called slavery period as far as this 400-year prophecy is concerned. Yeah, there seems to be a difference between uh, 1619 and 1623-24. So there's a couple of years where there seems to be... Um, Dates are not matching up. Yeah, you know, and it still gives us some room for it to come come about. You're absolutely right. Now, another prophecy that's related to these 400 years, I believe, is over here in Luke in chapter 21. Okay. This is when the Messiah is talking about the day of the Lord and such. Mm -hmm. If you would read verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the feet of Gentiles until the times of the Gentile be fulfilled. Do you know what they mean by the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled? Um, I do not. Do you know that all of the Gentiles are supposed to leave the earth? Mm, I, I think I do know that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. They call it the rapture. But all Gentiles, all wicked people, all people who are not either Israel or or grafted in Israel will be leaving this planet during the day of the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're not necessarily talking about uh, different nations or different races. No, it's not about races. It's about whether or not you're going to keep the covenant or not. Right. You know, his people are those who o obey and do what he said. I was thinking about this yesterday and a little bit of a tangent and put us back on track. But. How can a person say they love their parents when they won't do what their parents tell them to do? If you got a child that's 
you know, pick an age like 12 or 13 or something. And they claim they love their parents, but every time their parents tell them to do something, they refuse to do it. How can they then say they love their parents? It's just something that they're saying by instinct or habit. Or vanity. They're right. taking, that's what's called taking the Lord's name in vain. When you say you love the Lord or you say you are a Christian or you say you, you, you believe in God, but yet you won't do what the father tells you to do. He's our father. He's given us instructions. He expected us to follow those instructions, but yet we're going to sit here and act like we love him, but we won't do none of his instructions. Yes. Mm -hmm. That don't make sense to it. It doesn't. But anyway, getting back on track over here in verse 24, it's talking about the days of the Gentiles because that's coming to an end. Mm -hmm. Everybody that will not follow the covenant is leaving. They're going away. Like I said, they call it the rapture. Seven billion people are about to exit the planet and everybody that will be left will be obeying the covenant. They will not be Gentiles. They will be Israel mm -hmm. who, you know, all it takes to be Israel is to obey the feast days, the judgments, the statutes and the commandments found in Exodus chapter 20 through 23. Okay. Four chapters. But anyway, what this is talking about is how until this day, this so-called rapture date, when the Gentiles time is fulfilled and they get to leave until that day come, it's saying Jerusalem will be trodden down by Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So has the day of the Lord came yet? Not yet. Has the Gentiles been removed from the planet yet? Not yet. So who is over there in Jerusalem right now? Uh, the Gentiles. The Gentiles are over in Jerusalem. In fact, they won't let the true Israelites back in Jerusalem. No, uh, uh, they're kicking them out. So how can that be great sustenance? How can that be a judgment if they're still calling the shots? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we know that this, this two prophecy hasn't been fulfilled yet. Right. Matter of fact, let's go over here and let's see how some of this judgment can take place over here in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse four. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. See, this right here is when the Gentiles will stop trotting down the feet of Jerusalem. Okay. This right here is going to destroy Jerusalem. This is that earthquake. Well, it seems to be tied to that earthquake, but this is talking about that rock. You remember Daniel said that there was supposed to be a rock that's supposed to come down and destroy yes. the government systems, destroy the beast. Mm -hmm. Well, this is that rock that's going to destroy the beast. Okay. This rock is going to land on Mount Olivet, Mount Olive over there in Jerusalem. And it's supposed to be so big of an event that is going to break the mountain in half, sending half of it to the north, half of it to the east, and creating a valley where there used to be a mountain. Hmm. You think the Gentiles over there are going to survive that? I don't think so. I don't think anybody over there is going to survive that. You know, people all ask me all the time, am I ever going to Jerusalem or going there? No, you can't get me over there. Mm -hmm. Anybody that understands Zechariah 14 would never go over there, even to visit. You might get caught. Right. Because mm -hmm. he's saying here, that's where the destruction is going to be. It seems as though from this verse, one could deduce that all of this, like you said, that great earthquake, the huge day of the Lord is going to start with his feet landing on this mountain. Well, you know, it's just making me think how we know that a lot of the um, the Israelites that are over there, um, a lot of them love the father. Mm -hmm. A lot of them keep the feast, mm -hmm. and a lot of them um, are keeping his commandments. Mm -hmm. they, know, they'll be protected. Is that the reason that maybe in a you know a way that we don't quite understand that the Father is pushing them out of Jerusalem? Yeah, yeah, he's definitely separating his people the same way he brought you out of Egypt. You, you know, you not too many years ago, you was living in an urban environment and like on the wings of an eagle, you were swept away into this wilderness state. Right. He's doing that for people all over the world right now. OK, well, I have a question, though, but the people that are over there. But aren't they they keeping the feast too? not all of them. Okay. You have you have a lot of card carrying Jewish people over there. There's, yeah. there's a lot of people who are keeping the feast days. And if you're keeping the feast days, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Japanese. It don't matter. That make that grafts you in. That makes you his people. Just like those 
who have the physical traits or the the the, the haplocode H one E one, you know, that says that you are a direct descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even if you have their DNA, if you're not keeping the feast days, you will be considered a rebel, and you will be destroyed with the Gentiles. So it doesn't matter race or anything. It's whether or not we're keeping these feast days or not. We're going to see that here in a second. But what we're talking about here is this so-called day of the Lord and how it's going to take place or something related with this mountain being destroyed or removed from its place. But before we leave this, let's look at verse five. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fleed from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. So this is your earthquake. He's tying this event to this earthquake that we read about over in Revelation chapter 6. Mm -hmm. You know, this is some big stuff here. And I believe it helps us to understand how this 400 year prophecy will be fulfilled. What's going to go down? Mm -hmm. I mean, I heard somebody on, on YouTube the other day and he, he was kind of talking about this kind of stuff. He understood a little bit of scripture, understanding that this earthquake was coming, but he was talking about his, his insurance policy. Okay. And how he had this earthquake insurance in Jerusalem. He lived in Jerusalem and he had, and he was proud of his earthquake insurance. Mm -hmm. It's like, man, really? Who do you think is going to pay this? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we have a rock that destroys one city, it costs billions of dollars. Okay, now you have a rock that's going to destroy countries. Yeah. Who? How? Who's going to? Who's going to pay out? Right. I don't think he's going to get no. paid on that. <laughs> yeah, save that money and spend it on something else because you know the global earthquake. There will be no insurance. But there, there's nobody that's going to get rich off that. Right. In fact. I believe that's how our father's people are blessed out of this is because all of a sudden the playing fields have become equal. See, right now, if I go down here to the bank and I stand in this room, we got all different kinds of people around me here, the brokers that are broke. And then we got him over there who was a millionaire. We got him over there, you know, who's and we got all of these different kinds of people here. Mm -hmm. But when you have this event, that destroys the, the economy, it's going to make the plan feels equal. No longer are these people going to be able to use their money to look down on me and marginalize me and put me in a lower position because they're not going to have any money. Everybody will be on the same plane. Yeah. It's like all of a sudden we didn't all had to take off our, our military uniforms and our business attire and our, you know, NBA uniforms. And we all got to put on the same uniform, right? Some old raggedy scrubs or something, you know, and we are all the same. Yeah. We're all doing it together. Um, the way that I think the father meant for it to be nobody higher than the next person. But, Look at what happens next, though. You have this individual who was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, never having to do manual labor or even suffer without air conditioning or food for even a day or two of his life. All of a sudden finds himself in a similar position that I am. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there looking at him across the table going, welcome to my world mm -hmm. where we don't have money to buy people to do stuff for us. Right now. Who is in a more elevated position? Yes. I know how to build houses. I know how to make fires and cook wood, cook food outside. Mm -hmm. You know, I know how to crap in the woods. I know how to do all of these things that I was forced to learn to do because of poverty that these guys have never ever experienced in their life. Yeah. So, yeah. whereas we would have thought that it would have been equal, it's not equal at all. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm at a significant advantage because of my life experiences compared to theirs. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of times um, we think of investing uh, in, you know, gold, silver. But nowadays, the smart thing to do is to start investing in skills, skills um, and skills or and charitable trades. deeds. Yeah. yeah. Doing stuff for others. Um, but yeah, learning how to do stuff, you know, there's somebody's going to have to know how to put these houses back together. Right. Somebody's going to have to know how to get this water out of the ground. Somebody's going to have to learn how to get these diesel motors running off of 
pig fat. You know, somebody's going to have to have the skills. And I'm sorry to say the princes and the elite, you know, they're not thinking about such things. No, because they don't um, believe it's ever going to happen. They believe they're going to be flying around in cars like the Jetsons. And so that's where their focus is, mm -hmm. what they're in for a rude awakening. Or else um, taking going, trips to the moon. Yeah, they're going to the moon, <laughs> but they don't know they're going to be riding on the back of a donkey. <laughs> you know what I mean? And where are you going to get the donkey from? <laughs> you know, it's the poor guy that got the donkey. You know what I'm saying? Well, the rich guy, he got his, what they call them cars, the Tesla. The rich guy trying to get his Tesla, the poor guy got the donkey. Right. But, you know, when, after this so-called shaking of this earth, we're going to all wish we had a donkey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So that's the 400 years of prophecy. I believe we've proven that that hasn't happened yet. But let's come over and let's look at the book of Daniel chapter 12, because it seems to be giving us some hints on when it could actually happen. Okay. When you read in Daniel chapter 12, it's all about uh, Jacob's trouble. You see back there in verse one, talking about Michael standing up and there being a time of trouble such that no one could. Yeah. Mm hmm. Well, you see down here in verses 11 and 12 that he's given us some timing associated with these events. So that saying of no one knows the day or the hour. Well, that's even actually that scripture is not exactly what people think it is. Well, yeah, because, you know, when it's telling us that nobody knows the day or the hour it's talking about the return of Christ. And in one chapter and in another book, in another chapter is talking about the time when the earth is blown up, is burnt up. It's, in each case, it's saying nobody knows the day or the hour. You don't know that time that the earth will be burned up um, because the scripture tells us, you know, that it'll be in the year about 8,000, but it doesn't tell us the month that it's in. It doesn't tell us the season and it doesn't tell us the day of that event. It tells us about it. It tells us that it's coming, but there's nothing, no hints in any of scripture that I've seen on it. Yeah. And then the return of Christ. Well, we know that he has already returned. Right. That's an individual thing. Mm -hmm. That's why nobody knows the day or the hour is because it's up to you. Yeah. It depends on your personal spiritualization, not a world thing. Right. That's why you say every eye shall see is because that eye is in you. Mm -hmm. You think how in the world else could every eye on a planet see the return of Christ? Mm -hmm. You know, if it came in a cloud over here in the United States, they're not going to see it over there in China. Right. At least until a day later. Mm -hmm. But when you think about you and how you are the temple and how we are waiting for him to come into our temple. Mm -hmm. And then it's made clear because, you know, that that could, that would happen to somebody after watching this video. Right. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to see this and understand the importance of keeping the commandments and the covenant and these feast days. And they are actually going to become spiritualized takes a little bit of time but the process will start yes so and and from what i understand it takes a number of years to do this to mm -hmm. become spiritual individuals it's not instantly no no it, you know it, it took them back there in uh the wilderness with moses 40 years to learn how to live within the law right yes so it takes a little bit of time to learn especially when we're coming from an egyptian culture where we've gone through the public school system we've gone through the healthcare system we've been down to the courthouses and we've always been under the care of the doctors mm -hmm. it's a little bit difficult to all of a sudden put all of those manly institutions away, those big four man institutions to put those away and say, now I am going to depend on the father for my health, yeah. for my clothing, for my education, for my security. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it's a big deal. Yeah. Well, you think about how, like you said, you know, it took them 40 years um, and even, you know, days after they left, several of them wanted to go back. And so it does take time. It does take effort. And you're just not going to get it um, just because you say, you know, I want to become spiritualized. And therefore yeah, I, I want am to be, now. Yeah, it's going, you know, it takes time just like it did for our, you know, our forefathers in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. That's what Jacob's trouble is all about. That's that's the that's what Jacob's trouble means. You had Jacob who met the father in the wilderness on his journey. And 
made a promise that if our father would provide him for clothing and shelter, he would allow him to be his God. Yes. And the, and that that agreement was made between Jacob and our father. And it was at that time that Israel's name was ch- changed. Mm-hmm. He was no longer Jacob anymore. Now he was under the covenant and under the protections of our father. And he changed into Israel. Right. Well, it is similar to what all of us have to go through. Mm-hmm. We're all born as a Jacob, but through our understanding of the father's ways and covenants and taking on his provisions, we actually are transformed from Jacob into Israel. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as it goes, Jacob's trouble. And just because you are transformed or being transformed does not mean that you won't go through nothing. On the contrary, you will. Yeah. And, you know, but the father was always there with Israel every step of the way. And he will be there with us as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now we're looking at the book of Daniel and it's talking about the end of Jacob's trouble. Mm -hmm. You see the beginning of Jacob's trouble there in verse 11. If you would read that. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. All right. Let's come back to the numbers here. But when you see him right here where he's talking about this abomination that make it desolate. Mm hmm. He's telling him the timing between the time that the daily sacrifice was taken away and this abomination. He's saying that it's going to be 1,290 days. But we understand that a day is a year when it's talk when you're looking at these Daniel prophecies and many other prophecies of the scripture. So we have to understand that he's saying that this is going to be 1,290 years okay. from one event to the other. So it's just a simple math problem. Once we understand when the daily sacrifice was taken away, we simply add these 1,290 years to find when the abomination of desolation would be set up. Mm -hmm. But look over here in Matthew chapter 24, when you have the Messiah talking about the abomination of desolation. If you would read verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let them understand. Now, this part is important right here because there's a lot of people who are not really reading the scripture as we should. So there's a lot of people who are missing what he's talking about when he's saying the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. Mm -hmm. This is the only time you see something like this in the Bible where it said, whoso readeth, let him understand. Right. Mm -hmm. I've never, ever seen that in any other scripture Right. You know, in the in Revelations, it tells us that by reading it, you know, we'll gain wisdom and we'll gain favor. But um, this is all this is saying whosoever readeth, let him. Yeah. So if you ain't going to read it, you ain't going to understand this. And this is why so many people right now are delusional thinking that we are still waiting for the abomination of desolation. Mm -hmm. You know, our father, he's not only the author of wisdom, but he's the author of confusion, too. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we've seen that back, you know, in the days of Pharaoh and where he confused them. Yeah. yeah. Made them hard, hard in the heart. See, we have to understand that we are under the control of the Elohim right now. Mm -hmm. Mankind is being guided not only spiritually, but physically. They're actually moving us and making us do stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking on it um, last night how these angels would manipulate a person, you know, to fulfill their will. Mm-hmm. Like I, I like the example I was sitting and I made up or the father gave it to me was the burglar. Okay. So this person, now it's not the angel who makes the person decide, Hey, I'm going I'm to go rob this building. Mm-hmm. That's the own, own, the person's own free will. Right. We can make choices, but now the person then decided to rob this store and they done ran in the store with this mask on and they holding up the store, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's their doing. Mm-hmm. I believe that the way the Elohim manipulates different kind of situations in this particular example that I'm making up, that would be the reason why the guy all of a sudden, for some odd reason, shows his face to the camera. Mm-hmm. He done turn around and look. And so that's the reason why he's going to get caught later. Mm -hmm. I believe that was the Elohim that for some reason made him snap his head around. So now we got his image and now we're going to be able to track him down and catch him. Mm -hmm. Or else, you know, like, you know, he's reaching in his pocket to pull out something, pull out uh, a weapon or whatever. And, you know, 
his wallet drops out. Of the Drop, wallet yeah, and he like loses that. his car. Or, mm-hmm. or you, or he's standing there in front of the police officer and he's like, I didn't do it. I didn't do no, I don't know what you're talking about. And he pull and some drops out in front of the cops and he's like, mm-hmm. uh, what's that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That I believe, you know, that's how they're they're working to create their will, making sure that person ends up on the path that he's supposed to go. Right. He's not supposed to get away with this crime here. Right. All of us have have a you know a predestined path, and it's going to be fulfilled for for the purpose of um, fulfilling the the wrong that we've done in our previous times. You believe everybody is predestined? Ooh, somebody gonna comment on that. Oh, okay. All right, y'all, let's have a comment breakout. <laughs> Is everybody predestined? <laughs> Predestination. We'll save that one for another class. But coming back here to what the Messiah is talking about, this abomination of desolation, is saying when you see this thing that Daniel told you about, Daniel prophesied of this thing. When you see it, it's telling them to do what? Then let them, which be in Judea, flee into the mountains. So it's telling them to get out. And so this is what caused the desolation. That's what desolation means. Desolation means that the Israelites left. This is why the the place is actually still desolate. And to this day, the Gentiles are trodden them under their feet. It's still desolate because they won't let them back in. Mm -hmm. I remember one time, uh, well, you know, when before, I guess before you got the revelation of this here, um, understanding that, you know, we did think that it was talking about fleeing into the mountains and we were you know actually thinking about moving to the mountains of west virginia yeah that's why i didn't sell my house in west virginia Mm -hmm. out of all of the property we liquidated and all of the things we did you know like the scripture says you know the guy finds the pearl and he sells everything to to for that kingdom of heaven remember that prop that uh, parable Mm -hmm. well we still got that prop that house well we still got that house in west virginia because you know we didn't know if we had to flee to the mountains or not. Yeah, but, you know, just as the scripture tells you, whoever read it and you actually do a whole lot of that, you know, he'll get an understanding. Well, yeah, the father has revealed that it's, it's not necessarily talking about a futuristic event. This is the big point here. And people need to grasp this. You know, um, this ain't the Illuminati church. The Illuminati has their own definition of everything. The, the Illuminati definition of the abomination of desolation. Sure, it hasn't happened yet, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about scripture. We're talking about Daniel. And he gave us a specific timeline that told us when that abomination of desolation would show up. And the Messiah told us what we were supposed to do, and that was to flee. But the main thing that I want to bring out here is down here in verse 21, when it's tying this abomination of desolation to Jacob's trouble. Mm -hmm. This is the beginning of Jacob's trouble. Matter of fact, read verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. This is important to understand, so let's take this a little bit slow, is that this is all talking about the beginning of Jacob's trouble. Mm -hmm. See, like you said earlier, you know, we we was all kind of caught up in, you know, the, the lies of the church at one point. We thought this was talking about futuristic events, and now we're all sitting here waiting for Jacob's trouble. Mm -hmm. But what this is telling us here is that the the Jacob's trouble started with the abomination of desolation. You see right here, verse 21 is talking about the beginning of this tribulation, and then scrolling back up, you see where it starts there in verse 15, talking about the abomination of desolation. Mm -hmm. I spent a little extra time on this because this one is a hard nut to crack for a lot of people. We've heard this so many times that the abomination of desolation is going to come and you're going to have some wicked ruler standing in there. They're going to be the Antichrist. Yeah. That ain't scriptural, guys. We got to read. That's what the Messiah was saying. He who readeth, let him understand. What this is telling us is the beginning of Jacob's trouble. And that's easy to see when we come back to the book of Daniel, chapter 12 and verse 1. If you would read that. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stand for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So this is talking about the great tribulation. 
He's talking about a time of trouble such as was never was a nation. Mm -hmm. And that's similar to what Matthew 24 was saying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's got to be talking about the same event because we can't have two separate greatest times of trouble. Right. There's no such thing. (laughs) Right. And when you continue on through Daniel chapter 12, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about Jacob's trouble and how the wise is going to stand up through this trouble. We, We see all of that going on. And when you get down to verse seven, he starts giving him some information on the timing of this thing. Mm -hmm. He's actually telling him in verse seven is talking about the time that the people would be scattered, the scattering of the people. Mm -hmm. And he's telling them when this scattering period will be over. Now, this is not part of this class here. We'll cover that in another one. It's a little bit different prophecy. Matter of fact, I'll go into it just really briefly. What he's talking about here in verse seven, it's a little bit off topic, but let's, let's help me get back on track here. It's talking about the scattering here and how the scattering will be a time, time and a half a time. Really quickly, what this is talking about is Constantine and the beginning of the Catholic church. You remember back there, you had um, the emperor Constantine who in 312 decided that he was the king of the or the head of the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. He had been the emperor of Rome, killing all of the disciples beforehand, all of a sudden decided that he was the leader of the disciples and they should all come and take their instruction from him. Mm-hmm. Well, and he being the first person that we would know as a pope starting the Catholic Church that started in 312. Right. Uh, that actually started the scattering period, especially when you consider that Hillel too was there with him when they changed the calendar. Mm-hmm. Well, that actually started in 312. And then if you add these three and a half times that Daniel was talking about, it points us to the year 2027. Right. So this is kind of in this range that we're talking about. However, it's a little bit farther out. Mm-hmm. So that's why I didn't want to cover it in this class. We're kind of concentrating, you know, a little bit in this closer range that we're in. Right. But this is significant altogether yeah. because I believe this is telling us when the whole thing comes to an end. Mm-hmm. We're still waiting for it to get really started as far as some of these um, earth shattering events. We're still waiting for them to get started here. And we're going to get the timing on when I believe they, they're going to be started back over there in Daniel. But what this is telling us, I believe, is when it's actually going to be over. In 2027. Around 2027. 2027. Yeah, we have to get the months right understanding that, you know, the sacred calendar and the pagan calendar are have different months. Right. That's what verse 7 is talking about. All right. But let's come down here because it's continued talking about this purification process like you read about in verse 10. But then when you hear at verse 11, it's telling us the timing. Okay. It's saying that the abomination of desolation will come 1,290 days after the daily sacrifice was taken away. Mm-hmm. Now, we've covered this in many classes, but we can actually see how this prophecy worked out using this little chart here. All right. When you look in Daniel chapter 1, you understand that the daily sacrifice was taken away in 605 BC. That was during the third year of King Jehoiakim. You can look through the scripture to find out when the third year of King Jehoiakim was, or you can even Google King Jehoiakim. They're going to give you the same time. And that's 605 BC as the third year. He actually started his reign in 608, but his third year would have been in 605. So what Daniel was saying is from 605 BC until the abomination of desolation would be set up would be 1,290 days. Mm -hmm. Or 1,290 years. So we see that takes us to the year 686. So you say, well, what is the abomination of desolation that was put in place in 686 AD? Wow. That would have been the Dome of the Rock. Mm -hmm. You you, you know what the Dome of the Rock is? I do. Mm -hmm. It is a dome. It is a structure. It is a cap. It's a cap. (laughs) <laughs> that was put over the foundation stone. Right. That stone, that rock that uh, Jacob laid his head and made that promise we were talking about earlier, mm-hmm. where he had the vision of Jacob's ladder. That was on Mount Moriah, mm-hmm. the found, what they call the foundation stone. Mm-hmm. When Abraham was about to sacrifice his son Isaac, mm-hmm. he took him up the mountain. 
He took him up Mount Moriah and laid his son on that stone and was about to kill him before the angel of the Lord showed him a ram in the thicket. This stone, this rock is where Solomon built his temple. He built the whole temple on top of this rock. Mm -hmm. This is the same rock that Moses struck in the wilderness and made the water come out. Mm -hmm. This rock is the center of the world almost, yeah, in my opinion. And I can't remember exactly what scripture, but um, I'm thinking it's around the same scripture that talks about Jacob, where um, the father said that he would build his house there. Build his house there, and he absolutely built his house there. This rock, these people in the days of the disciples came in and burned the temple down in about 70 AD. Then they came back in 312 and changed the laws and the rules associated mm. with the worship of our father. Mm. Like the scripture says, they will change the times and the laws. Mm -hmm. Well, they started changing those times in about 312 with the Council of Trento, Council of Nicaea, whichever one that was back then. Then you have to understand the Knights of the Templar. These people, after they done pushed over Solomon's temple, then came in and set up camp on top of this site where Solomon's temple was, right where this stone is at. Spent years in there digging in and under the temple, pulling out the treasures. But you remember what was also under the temple. You remember the book called The Testament of Solomon mm -hmm. and how Solomon was kind of like a Ghostbusters kind of thing. Mm -hmm. He was actually capturing these demons right. and putting them under the temple. Yep. He put them in the basement. Yep. So now you have the Knights of the Templar, who are the founders of the Masons and the Illuminati's and all of these other um, 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 fraternal orders. The Knights of the Templar sat on top of this. They set up camp on top of this rock. And for years, until they gathered enough information, you can hear about the Knights of the Templar, they gathered enough information from this site that they then went to the Pope, the head, and told the Pope that they was now in charge. Mm -hmm. And it happened. Mm -hmm. The Pope said, okay, mm -hmm. whatever y'all say. Mm -hmm. And till this day, that's why Switzerland can't be touched. That's why their symbol is the same as the Knights of the Templar. Till this day, these guys are running the world in the form of the Illuminati. Until this day, this dome is the um, the 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 object of worldly controversy. So after the Knights of the Templar, now they didn't went in and bulldozed the complete site, and they set a cap on this rock. You can't go worship at this site now. So it so look what they have done. They have chased the father's people out separated them so they can't come back to this holy site and even put a big cap over top of it so you can't get to it. Who actually built this? Because I know that there's a war going on between the people of one side and the people of another side, and both of them are fighting to uh, have control of this dome. Well, just look at the building and you can see that it is a Roman structure. That dome is yeah. a Roman structure. Right. That's why you see it on all of the Capitol buildings mm -hmm. in America and over there. And that's they want to act like it's a Muslim building, and it may be a Muslim mosque today, but it was actually built by the Catholics. Okay. The same people that founded the Muslim religion. So how did they found this Muslim religion? Well, you have to remember the story. You had Muhammad, who was coming from you know kind of a um, family. He was kind of like an Abraham where he was born in a country that was into idolatry. And then M this Muhammad had this kind of this vision that told him that he was supposed to be monotheistic. Well, the first thing he did was he went to his wife, who was a Catholic. Her name was Khadija. And she, and she, one way or another, got him in front of some leaders of the Christian church at the time. You have to remember, they had been established over 300 years earlier. We were already well into the, the, the era of the Catholic church. You have now Mohammed, who is asking the Pope, I know, not directly, but he's basically going to the Catholic church and he, he told them his vision. You can read all of this in your history books. Read, read about the Muslim religion. It's all there. 
you, you he he told them of these visions that he had and he asked them was they right are these what i'm hearing is this is this a, and the religious leaders i'm not sure who they were at this point um that he talked to told him that his visions were right and that he should actually start promoting them and he did and after that they actually started helping to promote the muslim religion now, I'm getting this from several history books, and I'm sorry I can't cite all of them, from, but from what I understand, the reason the Catholic Church helped Muhammad establish the Muslim religion was so that the Muslims would help solve the problem of the Jews. Okay. You have the Jews, people of color, who are wanting to serve our father. And a good way to get them distracted is to put another religion in their face. Take, don't let them have the Bible. Give them the Quran instead mm -hmm. and let them use that. It doesn't talk about feast days. It doesn't talk about a lot of things that are necessary to our faith in the Quran. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge distraction. And you look at it today. How big of a distraction is it? Mm -hmm. How many people have left? the scriptural world and have gone to the Quran. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why they helped him. That's why they helped this. The, the story even goes on. They say they got Muhammad in a position where, you know, he was able to hear from the spirit world, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And that's how they even got the Quran. Mm -hmm. If you remember the movie, um, the book of Eli, where you had, at the end of the movie, Eli was there dressed in all white and he was regurgitating the scripture. Right. Well, that's exactly what Muhammad did. He regurgitated what he understood from the, the scripture. Mm -hmm. That's why you see some of the accounts of the creation in there. You hear about Abraham in there. You have this individual who is remembering what he used to understand or what used to be a part of the, 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 um, the faith we know now, uh, he was remembering and they wrote it down in what they call the Quran. That's why you find so many facts, scriptural facts in the Quran, but you also find errors. That's one thing about the Bible. That's one thing about inspired scripture. There is zero percent errors in it. So, this and I know this might we don't want to get too much off topic, but um, the Muslim religion and truth has nothing to do with um, Ishmael. Um, yeah, actually does because they are all the descendants of Ishmael. They're the four. They're Ishmael's forefathers, and Ishmael was the son of Abraham. And Muslim is based on the Abrahamic religion. Okay, I they they carried their information. Yeah, so they so it did come out of Ishmael. Okay. But anyway, I know we spent too much time on that. <laughs> the thing about it is this, is this dome of the rock that Daniel was talking about. Right. And the Messiah, that's why the Messiah said, let he that readeth understand. Mm -hmm. You have to read to understand that this dome of the rock was set up back there in 686. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was actually the beginning of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble started in 686. Okay. Now, like we talked about earlier. We know that the Illuminati has their own separate religion and they are waiting for Jacob's trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to remember, they're not Jacob and they're not Israel. Mm -hmm. The trouble they are waiting for is what's going to happen at the end of Jacob's trouble. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got Jacob who has been in trouble since 685 and you got the Gentiles who have been trodden Jerusalem under their feet and causing this trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, all of a sudden. At the end of this period that started in 685, Jacob is no longer going to be in trouble. Jacob is about to come out with this high hand. Mm -hmm. It is these other nations that are about to be judged. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you look at verse 12, he could be telling us when this judgment period will begin because it's telling us when Jacob's trouble will end. OK, I personally believe they go hand in hand like we talked about earlier. So if you would read verse 12. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. So we're looking back over here at this handy dandy chart and we see that that ends in about the year 2022. Okay. We have to take into account the month like you read about over there in Ezekiel chapter 24. 
and you see that it was on the 10th day of the 10th month that all of that went down. And so you would start there as your start point, the 10th day of the 10th month in 605. And so when you come that 1,290 days plus an additional 1,335 days, you end up in the year 2021, but then when you take into account the 10th day of the 10th month on the sacred calendar, mm -hmm. that actually ends up to be on or about January 13th of the year 2022. Okay. So, now look at this. When we were talking about earlier, the 400 year prophecy and how, remember the confusion, how we know it didn't start in 1619, 1619 and how there were free slaves or free indentured servants still walking around in 2024. Mm -hmm. So we see here that we are in the range of that prophecy. It could be, this could actually be the end of the 400 years. I believe the two go together. So around the time of January, we should start looking for this ending of Jacob's trouble. Ended of Jacob's trouble. But now I'm not a prophet. Right. I don't know the future. I'm a, I am an engineer. Yes. I can use my fingers and toes to count a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so these are pure numbers. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen at the end of Jacob's trouble? I don't know. Is it going to be that rock that we talked about earlier landing on Mount Olive? Is it going to be what we hear about in Revelation chapter six Is it, or Joel chapter two? Or is it going to be something else? I don't know what it's going to be. But yeah, you're right. If this is correct, and I ask everybody to verify it again, you know, we didn't, we didn't ask people to look over it. And, you know, a few people have made comments, but nobody has really said anything that changes any of these numbers yet. Mm -hmm. If they would, you'll see it in the comment section of the video. If this is correct, yeah, in January, we should start looking for something. Okay. Or we should start seeing something. I shouldn't say we should start looking for something because, you know, that never really works out. Yeah. We were looking for something in 2017. What yeah. did we see? Nothing. Yeah. We saw we we heard about that so-called Revelation 12 sign in the sky. Right. And everybody's eyes was big as quarters looking around to see what happened next. And there was no material manifestation of anything for us to gawk at. Right. Well, I'm afraid that that's happened so many times that now I don't even look no more. What you looking for? Yeah. It, it could be anything. And it could be spiritual as well. You know, so I wouldn't so I wouldn't say we necessarily start looking, but when we hear an explosion or <laughs> or could there just be um a change starting to happen? Yeah, it could just, just be an eternal change. change. Yeah. It could be, you know, I'm already starting to sense things changing as far as, you know, the prophecies around, you know, how the Elohim is supposed to be more active with us in the end days. Yeah. We're already starting to see hints of that kind of stuff. So you're right. It could be just something. It could be that great awakening that we hear about mm -hmm. where all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're going to be in tune with the new covenant. Oh, mm -hmm. it could be anything. Yeah, because, you know, when we think of great substance, our... um Humanic, I guess, human mind automatically think of riches or something like that, and you know we we yeah. definitely know that you know money is the least yeah. of of what we can we can have. So there, yeah. there there could be many things. Yeah, well, yeah, they think their substance that they came out of Egypt with was cattle. Mm -hmm. You know, cattle was a lot. That's food. That's clothing. That's shelter. I was watching a video where they made a tent out of pelts you know mm -hmm. so it's a lot of but anyway it, it, it may not be lexuses and lamborghinis <laughs> you know <laughs> but anyway let's go on i think the the point of all it is is that this actually could be related to the 400 year prophecy right now let me show you something else i think is related okay and that's this x across america yeah you heard about that I have heard briefly about it. Yeah, it was started in 2017 with a solar eclipse that crossed through uh, America, hitting about seven or eight towns named Salem. Mm -hmm. Of course, Salem is short for Jerusalem. And then in 2024, it's supposed to make another swath, creating what they call an X. Okay. But you know, that's actually not an X. Yeah, you were telling me that that um, is something else, and I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, well, when you look at the alphabet, talking about the Hebrew alphabet, the original language, you see that it's not an X. There are no X's in that alphabet. 
Mm-hmm. There's actually the letter known as Tav or Tau. Right. Well, I have a question. Why is it that we're seeing the United States? Because, you know, we have um, many brothers and sisters uh, who are Israel that are in different parts of the world. You know, we have from uh, Europe to, to Australia to China. Um, why the United States? This is the, this is the promised land. Without going through all of the scripture, you know, we've covered it in other videos. We can do it again if somebody needs it. But this America is the promised land. Going back to the original text of Genesis, you remember that the Garden of Eden was on the east, right? Yeah. The, the garden was placed in the east of Eden, which means that Eden was actually in the west. That's America. America is Eden. Mm-hmm. The garden was put over there somewhere around Egypt or, you know, Jerusalem or somewhere. That's where the garden was. And that's where Adam and Eve was. That's where the first humans were put at over there in the garden. But this land over here in America was always the promised land. This was the land that was promised to Isaac and, and everybody. So when we put all that we've seen so far together, these rock that's supposed to come over there land and destroy that part of the world and reference in the third testament which tells us that three quarters of the earth is supposed to go away in this earthquake what we understand is that it's likely that america may be one of the only continents left yeah the way i look at it is america and australia the rest of them are going away by this rock now this is a map of the earth looking down from the north pole A lot of the flat earthers use this particular map. Now, it's interesting is that when you come over here to where Jerusalem is at, which is somewhere about right here, and if you create a circle starting there in Mount Olivet that takes away three quarters of the earth, you end up with the continents of Australia left, North America and South America will be the only continents left. The way I understand it. So this is the promised land over here. It was like the father always knew, and he did. Of course, he's omnipresent and he knows the future. So he knows that humanity would start over in that part of the world. But he also knows that it would end in this part of the world. This is the new world. Mm. So that's why it's all about this part of the world, because that part is going away. Mm. That part is part of the three quarters that we may not see anymore. And we definitely know that's where the earthquake is going to start because Zachariah says that's where his feet is going to land. And when you put feet landing there with three quarters of the earth going away, yeah, it makes sense that this is the land of milk and honey, mm. cows and bees. We got cows and bees over here? Yeah, I think we do. This is the land of milk and honey. This is the promised land. But anyway, looking back over here at this Tav, we see that it is the last letter. Very similar to that mark that's being put across America, Tav has a Dramatra number of 400. Wow. Now, that to me... Well, what is the Dramatra? Well, each letter has a number associated with it. When you go back to the first letter, Aleph, it's a 1. When you go to the next letter, it's a 2. The letter Yod has the value of a 10. Okay. But then notice that in, instead of going to a value of 11, which would be the 10th letter plus the first letter, the next letter, Kaf, has a value of 20, and the next letter has a value of 30, and it continues on in such a way so that the last letter has a value of 400. Right. And that's really interesting in light of the end of this 400-year prophecy. Another thing is that is interesting, too, is... When the slaves were um, had to write a contract, they used a mark. <laughs> they had to write an X. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that's that's what this letter means. It's a mark or a sign. That's why they was they's doing it. So we're looking at this in relationship to the 400 year prophecy and how it's related. Look at the other meanings. Covenant. Mm. We talked about this new covenant that we're waiting on. Mm-hmm. This is somehow tied or related. We're not sure of the timing, but we know that it's in the same you know time range. Right. Uh, then it's joining of two things. That makes me think of the material and the spiritual change mm-hmm. that we're about to go through. Mm-hmm. The great awakening that we were talking about 
where all of a sudden we're not purely materialistic people, but we do have a spiritual, we get in touch with our spiritual nature, what we was referring to earlier as becoming spiritualized. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's the joining of the two. Yeah. And then you have the last. Yeah. So all it is, when we're looking at this so-called X across America ending in the year 2024, I think it's kind of related. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, you see, mm -hmm. it, 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 it could very well be pointing, like we were saying, Jacob's trouble was over there uh, in the book of Daniel was pointing to 2022. But now we have this right here in 2024. Right. So you say, well, how are they related? How? Why are they disjointed? Why is there a disconnect? Mm -hmm. I know I have asked this question. Mm -hmm. Why is there a disconnect between Jacob's trouble ending in 2022 and this X across America over two years later. Yeah. I believe the answer can be found in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 20. Okay. Remember, it's talking about Jacob's trouble. Yes. Talking about all of the stuff that we're going through. Mm -hmm. If you will, read verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So where he's telling us here, he's talking about Jacob's trouble and he's talking about this flight. And he's saying, pray that your flight is not on a sabbatical year. That's what he means by sabbatical day there. Mm -hmm. I believe he's talking about sabbatical year. Mm -hmm. This would be what they call the Semitic year, mm -hmm. the sabbatical year. Right. Every seven years, the land is supposed to take a rest. Right. So I believe this is how we can account for those years between 2022 and 2024. Okay. There's a sabbatical year somewhere between there. Mm -hmm. This sabbatical year is falling sometime between the ends of these prophecies. Right. So if you think about it, we're told to pray that our our flight is not on a sabbatical year. Mm -hmm. So that prayer being fulfilled would give us the extra year between the beginning of that blessing that we saw over there in Daniel and the year 2022 and this X across America in the year 2024. Right. Mm -hmm. Because not only is there a sabbatical year coming up, but there's actually a Jubilee year coming up as well. Mm -hmm. Do you understand why it's so bad for your flight to be in the wintertime? No, I do not. Well, do you understand that your flight was in the wintertime? It was. I remember. Yeah, it was. Yeah, you had to think about it. But, you know, in 2014, we left corporate America, mm -hmm. but we left with the intention of only changing industries. We were going from the nuclear power industry into the cattle industry. Right. Remember, mm -hmm. we was going to raise organic cows mm -hmm. and, you know, become farmers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the father had all the plans. In 2015, we became homesteaders. Yeah. Well, the fall of 2015 began the sabbatical year. Okay. And so your flight to this property started about that time. Mm. So then think all that happened because your flight started in the sabbatical year. Right. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Hunger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. Because your flight was in the sabbatical year, you had to suffer hunger. Yeah. Even right. if we didn't realize it. You didn't realize it, but that was going on. You was in the middle of a sabbatical year. Mm -hmm. You may not remember, but I had a lot of conversations with the father that year in 2016 because I was looking at all of these pecan trees, but yet none of them were dropping fruit. Remember that? I do. So we had no fruit. So although we should have had a lot of food from the property to eat, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. Every tree was bare. Mm -hmm. And I remember having that conversation with the father and questioning, why am I hungry? Why I'm on this land that's supposed to have all of this food, but nothing is producing. And the reason why was because it was in a sabbatical year. Our father was protecting me in my ignorance, me not knowing that it was a sabbatical year, would have harvested those nuts and we would have ate it and we would have got this land in trouble. Mm -hmm. So to help us out, squirrels ate the nuts or whatever happened to them. And then, and I don't know if this is relevant or not, but this land was actually very barren. And like you said, it was it was kind of weird because you got these humongous, I don't know how tall these trees are, and they're just barren. They yeah. have nothing on them. And then our land is adjacent to this other piece of land. Our land had no fruit on it. 
but this other land had lots of blackberries. Had lots of black, yeah. yeah. Had lots mm-hmm. of food, food that would have come in handy when yeah. we were, you know, just starting out. Right. Mm-hmm. You know? So that's why you want to pray that your sabbatical, pray that your flight is not in the sabbatical year because it's just going to be extra rough on you. Just going to be harder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like I said, I think this explains the gap between the two. The fulfillment of the 400 years and Jacob's trouble has a gap in it, seems. Mm-hmm. And I believe this is what the sabbatical year and maybe even the Jubilee year fill the gaps. I see why you say that. Yes. And I have another source, one over here that I'll show you guys from Jesus hyphen comes dot com. It's not necessarily scripture, but it seems to have truth in it anyway. And it's talking about a honeymoon. You know about the marriage supper that's supposed to happen? Mm, briefly. This is what's supposed to be the new covenant. We were talking earlier, the joining of the material and the spiritual. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what they call the marriage supper. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, we're looking over here at this source. Some of you know about Claire. She suggests that this marriage supper would last for a year. Okay. And... This, I believe, is what this year is from 2022 to 2024. I believe we'll be going through this kind of great awakening period that wouldn't take place in an instant, but would actually, you know, be be a kind of a longer period of time where you're learning and, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, getting used to the idea. Yeah. Mm hmm. Now, let's come over to Jeremiah in chapter 31, because I think there's another prophecy that's related to this, the sabbatical year and all of these timings. And that's what we read about here in verse eight. If you would read that. Behold, I bring them from the north and will gather them from the end of the earth to the feast of the Passover. And the people shall beget a great multitude and they shall return hither. So it's talking about this multitude coming out. That's what we heard about over there. We've been hearing about this in Genesis and everywhere else Mm -hmm. after this judgment. But here it's saying how he's going to gather them to the feast of Passover. Right. So you think about that. We have the Jacob's trouble potentially ended in 2022 in, in January. And then this gathering that should be around March or April in the year 2022. Right. Where he's gathering his people giving them a, just a little bit of time before he prepares them for the sabbatical year that starts later on in 2022. Right. Then in 2023, we have the beginning of the Jubilee year. Mm-hmm. And during the Jubilee year, we have the X across America. Okay. Which we didn't bring this point out earlier. We should have mentioned it when we was talking about the X across America and how when they crossed the River Jordan... They did so during a Jubilee year. Mm -hmm. We see that in the book of Jubilees, Mm -hmm. that it was a Jubilee year when they crossed the River Jordan. Mm -hmm. Well, that X across America will actually fall during a Jubilee year. Okay. So just as the sabbatical year is ending, the Jubilee year is beginning. Beginning. And we could very well expect some type of crossing of this modern day River Jordan. Okay. See how all of this is related? These yeah. prophecies mm-hmm. seem to all be pointing to the same thing. Yeah. That the day of the Lord is a huge event. All of the whole scripture is about that day. Okay. The Bible says if it wasn't for that day, we wouldn't even need scripture. Mm. We have to have scripture to tell us how to survive that day. That's yeah, why he gave us this that. book. Mm-hmm. If he hadn't given us this book, humanity will become extinct mm. because of nobody would know what to do. Right. Mm-hmm. And all you have to do is obey the law, statutes, and commandments. Very simple, I guess. Absolutely. Those are the ark. That makes up the ark. That modern day ark that's going to get us across these floodwaters are the statutes, the judgments, and the commandments known as the book of the covenant. There's even another prophecy that I believe is related over here in the epistles of the apostles talking about verse 17. Okay. Seems like this one is talking about the Jubilee year, Mm. um, the 120th Jubilee year. Matter of fact, turns out this next Jubilee that we're talking about will be the beginning of the so-called 121st Jubilee. Okay. Somebody like, whoa, where are you supposed to get 121? Well, the 121st is supposed to be when we get this so-called new covenant. It's supposed to be in a new era. That's supposed to be the beginning of the new time. Mm -hmm. So that's significant is because this 120th Jubilee is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. 
the end of the sabbatical year will be the end of the 120th Jubilee. Okay. So, you know, a lot of people get excited when they hear about stuff like that. Yeah. And I believe they have good reason because I believe it's all tied. All of these things are pointing to the same stuff. Yeah, it seems like all of scripture pertaining to Jacob's trouble is pointing to um, the times and the dates around this present time that we're in now. Now, one thing that we need to make sure we understand here is these feast days. Okay. You see how I was talking about um, back over in Jeremiah and chapter 38. We're looking in the Septuagint translation, but it's saying that they're gathered together at these feast days. Mm hmm. Well, when we look in the book of Revelation in chapter 7, verse 9, you see it's also talking about the importance of these feast days. It's talking about that multitude that no man can number. Mm -hmm. We see the same thing over here, talking about this great multitude. Right. Well, if you would, read verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So this right here is talking about the great multitude that no man can number. Mm -hmm. This is also talking about these people that are supposed to come out with this great substance. This is Jacob okay. at the end of Jacob's trouble emerging with this great substance. All right. But notice also they got palms in their hands and white garments. Right. This is talking about feast days. Mm. The white garments is talking about Passover. Mm -hmm. And how after we get those garments at baptism, we can get them refreshed or re or bleached at the Feast of Passover every year. Right. Mm -hmm. Every year we get our garments rewhitened at Passover. Right. And then when it's talking about the palms in your hands, mm -hmm. we have these palms in our hand during the Feast of Tabernacles. Yeah. That's how we celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles is we walk around with these palm branches. Yeah. So what we're hearing here in the book of Revelation is this multitude that's going to have this great substance will be those who keep the feast days. Mm. That's important. Those who will not keep the feast days will not be around during this period. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is through the keeping of the feast days, like we said, Passover, that the father is going to come in and gather his people. And then that reminds me of what we read in Jeremiah 23 and 7. If you would read that. Therefore, behold, the days come, said the Lord, that they shall no more say, the Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So this here is also like we started off saying how these end times events are being tied back to the time of the Exodus. Mm -hmm. It's like the Exodus was a living parable to let us know what is coming. Yes. All of these things are related. Mm -hmm. So what it's saying here is that there's coming a futuristic event that we call the day of the Lord. That's going to be similar to the days of Egypt back then when he removed them. But he's saying that we ain't even going to think about those no more. Mm -hmm. We're going to be talking about exiting this modern day Egypt. Right. So it's saying that it's going to be the same or similar. Yeah. Mm hmm. Probably a lot more significant. These feast days are extremely important. So there you have it. You have three separate prophecies. The 400 years. Yes. Jacob's trouble. Yes. The sabbatical years. I mean, we got like, even more prophecies. You got the, I mean, we've covered probably seven prophecies. All points into with, uh, with a time period within about two or three years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems like it starts, starts there in January of 2022 yeah. and comes to an end somehow in 2024, not considering what we read over in 2027. But, you know, I think that's related to the days of darkness. You heard about the three days of darkness? Yeah, I've I read something about it, but I don't know the significance. Without a whole lot of scripture to back it up, I believe that it starts with that X across America and three years of darkness takes us to the year 2027. Mm, okay. So I believe that's how all of that's tied up and related where, you know, we have, you know, these earthquake and this meteor shower and all of this stuff that we see in Revelation chapter six, which starts the three days of darkness until the scat the ending of the scattering there in 2028 or 2027. So we just wanted to, you know, add and talk about all of these prophecies and stuff. And, you know, hopefully, you know, some of it makes sense. And if it don't, let's continue it down in the comment section. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you guys got anything out of this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't hit that dislike button, but if you would leave us a comment. 
Yeah, we'd be interested in hearing um, if you um, agree and, you know, have, you know, maybe you have something to uh, add. To yeah, definitely. If you have something to add, yeah, definitely add that. You know, and even if you disagree, right. you know, it's not about, you know, people thinking that we're right. You know, we, we want to be factual in whatever we do. So if there's some errors or anything in any of this, you know, let's talk about it. If you think there are, let's talk about it. We'll do some more research, you know, to make sure that we are as factual as we can be, as the father will allow us to be. And I would just say, you know, when they present something to you to just bring scripture with it. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know me. Yeah. You know, if, uh, if it doesn't have a lot of scripture, I try to ignore, you know, people's feelings and what they think. You know, everybody has an opinion, but let him who readeth understand. Yeah. With that, we'll say shalom. Shalom.